Hello everyone, my name is Raman and today we're together to visit the gorgeous little hill of Montmartre, all right? So follow me, we start right now, the hill is right behind me. All right guys, so we start our tour on this very lovely Friday sunny morning. It's 8 in the morning, this is the reason why it's pretty jammed on the street. And we start at the foot of the hill of Montmartre. Indeed, this is the little street we're about to take to climb the hill. But I would like you, before we climb there, to look at this enormous boulevard. Indeed, it tells us a lot about the history of Montmartre. Because we used to stand at what used to be the outer wall around Paris. Yes, exactly. Imagine this huge boulevard as an outer wall around Paris until the end of the 1800s, standing on that side, you'd be in Paris, and standing on that side, you'd be outside Paris. Be careful, however. We're far from like an enormous defense wall uh, coming from the medieval times. No, it used to be a pretty low wall, but it was only a tax wall to make sure that all the goods going into Paris would go through taxes. And you see, this very simple fact explains already a lot about the history of Montmartre. Because indeed, during all the 1800s, you have to imagine that everything on that side, so to the north, you know, in Montmartre, outside Paris, everything on that side used to be cheaper. Accommodation, uh, drinks, food. So you have to imagine that if you were a Parisian, but if you were absolutely broke, like for example, let's say an artist like Van Gogh or Picasso, that would be the perfect place for you. Not only because the accommodation would be extremely cheaper than the rest of the city, but as well because it would be a perfect place for partying. All the bars, cabarets, all the places importing alcohol would rather stand on that side of the wall to be cheaper. Another very important thing to understand about Montmartre is that uh, because it was outside of Paris until the end of the 1800s, it was mostly preserved from the massive Paris renovation. Remember that, I mentioned this in the other tour in the Latin Quarter. I told you that in the 1860s, Paris was almost like 50% destroyed and rebuilt the way you see it today with this large and straight boulevard by Mr. Haussmann, the urbanist. Well, when this happened, Montmartre, right here, was still outside Paris. So, oh, we're crossing the street, I'm gonna take my shot. Montmartre was still outside Paris, and so this is the reason it was preserved from those destructions. Still today, it looks like a cute tiny village, as we're gonna see together. And no, of course, I cannot go further before mentioning the very, very famous Moulin Rouge. So you see, we are very early in the morning, so this is still closed. I'm gonna just get to the entrance. You see, here it is, the very famous Moulin Rouge. So, Moulin Rouge is maybe one of the most famous cabarets of all Paris. Uh, it was built, uh, in a, it opened in 1889, okay? So it's quite easy to remember uh, the year of the opening because this is the exact same year as the construction of the Eiffel Tower. Um, one, uh, it, it, it was like super famous from the beginning, not only because some of the most famous artists used to live there or used to perform there, okay? But as well because it was the first building in all Paris to be equipped with electricity. So people would like gather here and stack up here, not only to see the very famous dances that we're gonna mention, but of course, because they would see for the very first time of their lives, light bulbs. So Moulin Rouge, what do you think it means? It means the red windmill. Windmill, simply because the, the, um, the, the hill of Montmartre used to be covered up with windmills. We're gonna see a few of them during our tour. But red, it's because this, the Moulin Rouge is very tied to the idea of red lights. Yes, indeed, you're gonna see that the history of Montmartre and the history of Moulin Rouge is very tied to the history of prostitution, of provocation, of always being at the edge of what is legal. And indeed, if you look at this woman dancing, then I guess you heard about the very famous dance that was created, I mean, that was maybe not created, but that was super popular, in the Moulin Rouge, the French Cancan, with the woman doing, you remember, this with her legs. So today it's a pretty funny, uh, it's a pretty funny uh, dance. You know, people maybe 
forgot what was super provocative about such a dance. But you have to understand two things. First, in the 1800s, we are in a time when most of the moment, women would barely dare to show one ankle when those women were showing their own legs. In addition to that, this way of dancing, having the legs doing this and this and this, is a way to mock the army, to mock the order. Okay? So, you, have, you, really try, you truly have to understand that back in a time, in the 1800s, when you came here to see those uh, women dancing the French Conqueror, it was extremely provocative. Okay, I can show you a slightly small image right here. So see, that would give you a very, very good idea of what uh, those dances used to be like. So it was not only a place, of course, for uh, shows, it was a place for many different types of shows, but it was a place for drinking. And this is the reason, if you would come here at the end of the 1800s, you would have met some of the most famous painters of their times. For example, you would have met the very, very famous Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec is a very famous painter of the late 1800s, and if you come in Paris, then you have to go to the museum with most of his paintings, of course, the Musée d'Orsay, just facing the Louvre on the other side of the river. Um, Toulouse-Lautrec, I really love this painter for the reason that he's the guy that depicted with the most passion, um, with a very lovely look, a lovely sight, uh, the lives of uh, those poor and pretty shady districts. You have a lot of paintings of Toulouse-Lautrec showing with a lot of realism the hard lives those people used to have, the prostitution, the alcoholism, but as well the fun, the parties, the dances. Here as well you would have, you would have met people like Van Gogh, of course we're going to talk about that. Uh, so no, the Moulin Rouge is still pretty active if you come at night from 5 p.m. the red windmill starts to turn around starts to rotate and it's all unlighted however the atmosphere changed a lot it's really less about this shady prostitution thing and really more about um, basically touristic shows <laughs> I have to say you won't you won't meet much French now so you see I started to climb up the hill so maybe maybe a few words about the kind of people you're going to meet in Montmartre. Montmartre is a very particular place with its own culture. It always uh, kept and preserved this artistic, uh, this artistic spirit. Still here, people consider themselves as like kind of a culture apart. Still here, people consider themselves as the descendant of Van Gogh, Picasso, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec or Monet. <laughs> you see, Monet, M-O-N-E-T, the painter. So as a consequence, you can see there is still, for example, a very deep need of preserving the little shops, preserving uh, the little butcheries, the little bakeries, and as a consequence, when you wander in Montmartre, when we're going to wander in Montmartre together, you're going to notice that there is almost no supermarket. You see this traffic jam? It's absolutely usual in Montmartre because, as I told you, those are very super small village streets. In addition to that, we are early in the morning, so we are during the delivery times, which assures you that in most of the shops, in all of the shops, you're going to go in Montmartre, you're going to enjoy fresh products. Before I go even further, maybe we should have a short sight to uh, this super famous bar. So I don't know if it looks familiar to any of you guys, but it should if you remember one of the most famous French movies around the world, Amélie Poulain. Indeed, Amélie Poulain is this movie, um, I think from the, the 2000s, I think. And Amélie Poulain is the story of a girl living in Montmartre and working as a waiter in this cafe. So what I love with this cafe is even if it became extremely um, touristic, people here still remain super nice and according to the Parisian tradition, even if it could be very expensive, if you sit on those tables, if you get your coffee standing up at the bar, still it's one euro, like it's always supposed to be. All right, so talking about bars, um, we're gonna keep climbing up. See, so you really, uh, Right now, you're really enjoying the very, very, very particular Montmartre atmosphere. People climbing, jogging. This is a, a delicious morning today. And of course, people honking. There is one thing I'd like to say because we mentioned the bars. As I told you, Montmartre was famous for all the bars, all the parties, but as well famous for the terrible consequences of alcohol. 
For example, there is one alcohol that was extremely popular in Montmartre, and you might have heard of it before. It's called absinthe. Absinthe. Absinthe, indeed, is an alcohol which looks very green, and you can basically have um, see a glass of absinthe on most of the paintings of, the, of that time, and it's mentioned in most of the books of that time, in most of the poems. Oh, sorry. I'm just gonna cross the street, trying not to get killed. Okay. <laughs> and so I'd just like to show you something. I hope it's here. So you see, here people are still selling some absinthe. So absinthe was extremely popular at the end of the 1900s. It's a very, very, very strong alcohol made from a mixture of, a mixture of herbs. The problem is that this alcohol was extremely strong and the production was not state-owned, state-controlled. So many people, in order to make it cheaper, used to mix it with methanol. You see, this one is one of the most famous brands. So what is the problem with this alcohol? First of all, you have to understand that basic, at the very, very end of the 1800s, uh, in 1901 mostly, a terrible disease, a terrible plague, killed all the vineyards of France, making the price of wine absolutely unaffordable. All of a sudden, absinthe became the most consumed alcohol of France. And as I told you, it's very strong and most of the time a very, very bad quality. The consequences are that people used to turn absolutely mad with this alcohol. It was nicknamed the Green Fairy because of all the hallucinations it would give you if you consume it too much. It was so toxic that in 1911, it finally became illegal. And so today, it only became legal again a few years, a few years ago. So truly absinthe is part of the history of Paris. Uh, and if you look closely, if you look with attention, if you pay attention to a lot of paintings of Picasso, of Van Gogh, of Manet, of Monet, sometimes in the background, kind of hidden, you can see a strange green ghost, mostly having the shape of a woman. She's the green fairy, the incarnation of uh, the hallucinations and addiction to absinthe. And now, just before we go further in the heart of Montmartre, look at above there. I don't know if you can see in the distance, we're going to get closer anyway, the absolutely gorgeous windmills of Montmartre. So they are very old, okay? Uh, this one might be standing here, even if it was renovated many times, has been standing here from the 1600s, so it has like basically four centuries. There is a pretty dark story about this windmill. Let me tell, it to, you. Let me tell it to you. Indeed, at the very, very, very end of the Napoleon's reign, uh, you know that all the European armies united against France that finally got defeated. So all the European armies finally invaded France and then Paris. The Paris siege did not last longer, but the family here, one father and four sons, decided to resist against all the European armies. They had to fight, only the five of them, against a war regiment of uh, uh, Cossacks, you know, this very brutal Russian cavalry. So they fought for maybe like 24 hours, but they finally had to surrender. Well, as a punishment, the father was ripped in four pieces and each of the pieces was nailed to one of the fan. For all the Parisians would see from their home what could be the price of trying to bring back Napoleon. One of the, th one of the sons, however, survived. He got a spear through his belly, was nicknamed Belly Hole, but he survived. Keep this guy in mind because it's going to play an important role during our tour. Okay, we're now going all along the very lovely Le Pic uh, Abbess Street. So this is, I could say, the um, commercial heart of the village. This is where you're going to see most of the shops and most of the most of the activities. It's absolutely lovely. Okay. Just for a second, I won't do any comment, for you can enjoy the atmosphere. You see, all the fruit shop just got delivered. All the Parisians are getting their coffees now. Uh, something you really have to feel uh, and see in Montmartre is that on the contrary of places like Notre Dame or the Eiffel Tower, where you will never see any Parisians wandering around, or the Champs-Élysées, the same, you will never see any Parisians on the Champs-Élysées, 
Montmartre is still today very popular among uh, the Parisians. So it means that when you come here and when you look at all those people wandering around and sipping out their coffees, well, those are real Parisians. I think, but this is in my opinion, and one of the best timing if you truly want to enjoy the Montmartre atmosphere is to come here on the Friday evening, last working day, last working day of the week. All the Parisians come here to enjoy sun and one last good glass of wine on the of the Montmartre terraces. Of course, we cannot talk about Montmartre if we don't mention the food. Yes, indeed. Because it's not, uh, because it's still a very preserved Parisian place, Montmartre is a place where you're going to find a lot of very good food. One very simple example, this bakery right here on the left. You see? It looks cute, but pretty random. And yet, this bakery, this bakery right here produces the best baguette of Paris. So you might be surprised because you can, you're going to be like, how, how, how do you judge that? But this is so French. There is a jury. There is basically an exam. There is a, a tournament for all the food existing. Even better, you know that in, when you go to a bakery in Paris or in France, sorry, in all France, let me, give, let me give you an advice. If you really want to be sure that your baguette is excellent and crusty and good, always order for a baguette tradition traditional baguette the reason is the reason is very simple when you order this baguette tradition then you order a baguette which is um, preserved and which is uh, protected by the state itself uh, people producing a baguette tradition have to follow a very strict a very severe recipe they can't cheat so every time you have a baguette tradition you are a hundred percent sure that you're having one of the best uh, uh, ingredients uh, possible for a baguette. Look at this. You see? So even if this bar is not one of the oldest bar of Montmartre, still it's one of the most popular. It's absolutely gorgeous on that on that Friday morning. Up. So here you can see a pretty beautiful view and in the very distance you see a very important building of Paris uh, in the heart of the 9th and 8th district, the Opera built uh, in the 1860s when Paris was all renovated by uh, Mr. Hausmann. So those are the trash, the trash is, uh, trash is trucks. All right, so now look at that. The thing is, to be honest, it's been a very long time I didn't come here and it's so beautiful, like <laughs> I lack comments to do. One thing I'd like uh, to really like to show you, most of the time the people in Montmartre, the people visiting Montmartre totally miss it, is this amazing church. So this church is very, very particular. First, because being built at the very uh, late 1800s, it was the first church to be built only with reinforced concrete. I mean, about the inside structure. So it made it a very, very modern church. But what is interesting is about the structure. I don't know if you remember that, but I mentioned quickly in our Latin Quarter tour that one of the most um, popular style of architecture in the late, very, very late 1800s was what we call Art Nouveau. Remember Art Nouveau? I'm going to show you a little bit of Art Nouveau, just right here. See this uh, metro station? This is typically Art Nouveau. So, Art Nouveau, remember, is a very organic, very curvy style that was created in, as an answer, as a reaction to Paris being only built with uh, uh, straight lines, geometrical lines, and the society being basically uh, um, all made of gears and machines. You know, this is the time of industrialization of France. So, as a, as a reaction, some artists created this style, very organic, almost made with bones. So, it was all okay as long as people would only design uh, places like this so metro station entrances but this church was designed Art Nouveau and that was extremely modern it was extremely uh, ahead of its time and this is the reason why when it got built it was extremely unpopular and yet today I consider it as one of the most beautiful church of the north of Paris
All right, guys, so now we're gonna have a little break for I can climb up without being absolutely uh, exhausted and incapable uh, un to breathe. I'm gonna catch you up in a few minutes just above the street. And here we are, it's me again. So, you see, I just climbed up the street like together, we were just down this street. But I climbed up the street and look at this amazing view we have. I'm gonna try to zoom, all right guys? I'm not sure the quality of the image is gonna be excellent, but I really want you to enjoy the incredible view we have. You see this building in the distance? This building in the distance is called the Invalids. Invalids is today the Museum of the Army and the Tomb of Napoleon. However, when this thing, this enormous gold thing was built, it was not uh, the Napoleon Stone, because it was built by Louis XIV. The Sun King has a, a hospital for veterans, for former soldiers. This is today, as I told you, the Museum of the Army and about the, non the number of pieces, the number of objects there, it's almost as big as the Louvre. You can visit the building, uh, we can basically enter the building for free to enjoy the architecture. And you can visit, of course, Napoleon's tomb, which is just beneath the Golden Dome. And now, guys, we are about to explore together one of the loveliest square of Paris. So again, uh, and something I'm gonna, you're gonna hear me repeating a lot of times, but you have no idea how lucky we are to be in such a calm moment of Montmartre. You see, because of this COVID and be because of the COVID and because of this situation, Montmartre is absolutely empty. Seeing Montmartre so calm and so peaceful, it's quite an unusual sight. So, this place, oh, it might look quite insignificant, and yet this is a concentrate of history and art, le bateau lavoir. Bateau lavoir means, if I really roughly translate it, the um, washing boat, let's say. The reason is pretty simple. You are facing some artist studios, very, very old artist studios from the late 1800s, nicknamed the washing boat for, sim for the simple reason that it was originally just a few pair of uh, artist studios, um, very small rooms on each side of a long corridor. So they called them, they called it the boat. And as well, the washing boat, simply because for all those artists working here, there was only one uh, bathroom. So it was pretty dirty. So ironically, they called it the washing boats. But what is the most important to know about this place is that this is where artists like Picasso used to live. This is here that Picasso settled in 1905 when he arrived in Paris for the first time. And keep in mind that in 1905, no one, no one has ever heard of uh, Picasso. The guy is absolutely broke, unknown. Uh, he has a lot of difficulties speaking French. Don't forget that he's Spanish. And this is here that he's gonna settle and paint some of his most famous paintings. So imagine that this is in this place, basically, that Cubism, the Picasso style, was created. Imagine that if you would have come here, like, more than a hundred years ago, you would have seen here, on, uh, on those walls, or on those benches, people like Monet, Manet, Renoir, Picasso, Van Gogh, sipping up their coffees and talking about art. So it's absolutely incredible. What is amazing, what is amazing with, this, uh, with those studios is that they're still active today. You still have artists living in those. And even more impressive, the accommodation to live here is only 100 euros a month, which is incredibly cheap considering, considering the rest of the hill, simply because the family owning this place still wants um, to keep the spirit of helping up poor artists. No, something very stranger, it's this yellow thing. You know something about this yellow thing? Well, this is probably the first and last time you see it because this is entirely fake. Indeed, as it happens a lot in Montmartre, I'm standing right now in the middle of a movie shooting. So <laughs> you can see all the material is here and there is a lot of trucks out there. We're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna go there. But as you can, as you can see, uh, we arrived early, so the shooting didn't start yet. But trust me, as a guy that has been active for like years and years in Montmartre, it's, it happened many, many, many times that my tour um, 
was interrupted or I had to change the route because of uh, movie shootings. I'd like to show you as well this very, very typical Parisian item. Look at how beautiful this is. This is a water fountain. Look at how it works. You have this button just right here, right? I'm gonna push it. And here it is, you see? And this is almost, of course, absolutely drinkable water, super fresh and cold, even if the heart of the hottest summer. So why do I decide to uh, mention those very particular fountain right now? First, because they are absolutely typical of Paris. You're gonna see them everywhere you go. There are dozens and dozens everywhere in the city. But more of that, they have a very important story. You see, today we are on a very important date in Paris. We are on the 28th of May, all right, 28th of May 2021, which means like exactly 150 years ago, exactly 150 years ago, uh, finished one of the most important revolution of Paris called La Commune de Paris. So don't worry, we're going to talk about it a bit later. What I just want you to remember to understand the story of this fountain is that La Commune is maybe one of the most brutal revolutions we ever had. And on the 28th of May 1871, thousands and, uh, sorry, thousands, maybe like 20,000 Parisians lay dead on the ground, all Paris is in flames and destroyed, okay? It, Paris was in ruins, imagine that the Louvre was burning, the Palace of Justice was burning, the Orsay Palace was burning, okay? And so those fountains were given to Paris, offered to Paris by an extremely rich, like a, a, a million, a billionaire philanthropist, like uh, just a generous guy, a British guy called Richard Wallace. He offered those fountains to Paris, okay, Richard Wallace. So this was one of the most important um, network of running drinkable water in Paris. So I just want you to realize that this guy, this billionaire, Richard Wallace, was so shocked and traumatized by the violence uh, of this uh, uprising, the violence of this revolution, and all the pains that the Parisians went through during this revolution and during the war between France and Prussia just before, that he offered up, he offered, okay, those fountains to Paris. So everywhere you go in Paris, you're going to always find those lovely fountains, still called today the Wallace fountains. So I'll just let you enjoy for a few other seconds the peaceful beauty of this place and no we're gonna keep climbing up the hill something I'd like you to notice as well when you wander around is the strange color of the stones in Montmartre indeed on the country of Paris which is mostly built with limestone so being white uh, as long as that's uh, at it's like often often cleaned in Montmartre the stones are pretty different because those are Pierre Meunier millstones it's a very particular stone that you can find in the uh, underground of Montmartre and this is the reason why Montmartre was mostly built uh, with those kind of stones you see okay you see it's full of bubble and this is the stone that people used to use in their windmill uh, to crush the grain look at that so this is the back doors of the RT studio. This is the most well-preserved part, okay? The other entrance we saw, it burned in 1960s, so it was rebuilt, but this never changed. And what's funny is, I don't know if you realize that, but this was so old and originally so poor that still today the doors are not standing straight, you see? It looks like some Tim Burton's movie. So you can see on my right, you have all the trucks and all those trucks are uh, materials for a movie shooting. So I don't know what they're shooting actually. Um, I don't even know what is the movie there. So I, I kept mentioning, I kept repeating to you that Montmartre used to be a poor place for poor artists, for broken people. And yet, when you look around now, it's super posh, super rich. So what happened? Well, what happened is a heavy gentrification of the hill in the 1960s. Indeed, in the 1960s, Montmartre had this reputation of hosting some of the greatest artists. And all of a sudden, all the artists, intellectuals, writers came to live on the hill. You see, it kind of became our uh, Beverly Hills uh, of Paris, if you want to see that. So 
one of the best examples of this gentrification, of this Beverly Hillization of Paris, is this house. This enormous house you see used to be owned and was built by one of the most famous French singers in the world. Uh, which is called Dalida. So you can, you, we're going to speak a little bit of her life, but Dalida is a singer that uh, was active basically during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. All right, and this is where she lived. Okay, so you see, the, the 60s is the moment when they hail from this lovely place, for, lovely, poor, and a little bit dangerous place, uh, turned into a place covered up with enormous mansions like this one. However, even if Dalida was very rich and was lucky enough to have this house, uh, she had a pretty sad life. Um, she had like three different boyfriends, three husbands that all of them committed suicide. And sadly, she finally committed suicide herself in this house. You see, she died in 1987. Uh, if you want to see her name written, Dalida. You see? <laughs> okay. So we're moving around. Ah, it's a shame that this uh, truck parked just right here, but you see, you're going to see a super nice surprise for you. So it's a bit of a shame because you can see that the wall was uh, recently repainted. However, this is one of the places in Montmartre when you're going to see most of the street art. So if you come in Paris this summer, this little street called Orchamps. It's going, to be, it's going to be all covered up with street art. And now, look at what is waiting for us. A windmill. So it's not exactly the one we saw from down the hill, because the one we saw from down the hill is right behind this house. But those two windmills are the two last ones remaining from the almost 30 that used to cover up the hill. Okay? So this one is extremely famous for one simple reason. Do you remember the guy that got crucified on a windmill? You remember that guy that tried to resist for uh, the return of Napoleon? Well, I told you that one of his sons survived. So you can guess that the guy was pretty traumatized by his, uh, traumatized by his experience. So this is the reason why he decided to stop his activity as just a windmill. And he decided to turn his windmill into a ball, into the most famous nightclub of the late 1800s in Paris. Yes, indeed, this place used to be a place where people would come not to work, not to work in the windmill, but to dance, to drink. And I'm sure you heard about Le Moulin de la Galette. I'm sure you heard about it because you must have seen the very famous Renoir painting. You can see some pieces here. You see, remember? the Renoir painting called Le Bal du Moulin de la Galette, one of the masterpieces of Impressionism, was painted just right here. It was depicted the life of those people. Okay, So you see that this, this painting is extremely, it's ex extremely moving because this is depicting the, the, hist the history of those people, their standards of living. They didn't have much. You see, as I told you, here you come here because everything is cheap. You come here because you're pretty much poor. It was a place for the people to come and just relax away from the industrialized Paris, away from the coal smoke that used to cover up the city. This place was as well a place of liberty. For example, uh, in, if you look closer to, the, um, closer to the painting, you can see, for example, a woman like this. So they just randy, randomly look like they're just, you know, chatting and uh, maybe flirting with people. But we are in the late uh, 1800s. It was pretty shocking for this very conservative society to see lone woman flirting um, in a park or in a ball. So Montmartre was, of course, a place of uh, prostitution, as I told you, a place of woman oppression. But it was as well a place where people, uh, where women used to have liberty sometimes for women used to uh, fight for their rights if i can say so so the very top of the hill is in this direction that would be the sacre coeur but we're going down right here because we're going to turn around the church uh, the sacre coeur church turn around the top because i want you to see some of the greatest sight of montmartre so everything here is very very calm 
this bar is absolutely new. It wasn't wasn't a, um, wasn't open before COVID. You see. So I keep repeating the name of this hill, Mont March, Mont March, Mont March. But what do you think it means? Uh, let's try to look through this grid. I don't know if you see. I'm gonna try my best for you to see it. There is a strange statue there. A statue of a guy being decapitated. He's holding his head in his hands. Well, don't worry, we, we won't look at this statue too long because it's a very modern and ugly statue. But this guy being decapitated, his name is Saint Denis and his history is pretty interesting. Indeed, Saint Denis is famous for being the first bishop of Paris. He was the first bishop of Paris in the 200s after Jesus Christ. And this is a pretty, pretty important date because as you might know, uh, the 200s after Jesus Christ, Paris isn't called Paris. Paris is called Lutetia and this is still a Roman city. It was totally forbidden to be Christian, totally forbidden to be a bishop. And Saint Denis got decapitated at the top of the hill of Montmartre. And if you think about the name, Mont, the mountain, Mart the Martyrs, okay? Indeed, Montmartre means basically the mountain of the Martyrs because Saint Denis and all the other Christian Martyrs got killed here by the Romans. You see this woman? This is Dalida, the singer we told, uh, we told about, I told you about, you see? So she's very, very famous in the hill. Um, there is this old square named after her. And you can see that there is a kind of a strange custom, not, not the best taste, I must say, but her breast is golder than the rest of the statue because all the people passing by uh, mostly take pictures of themselves touching her breasts. So again, this is some kind of a fun. And now look at, be ready for the most gorgeous view of Montmartre. Look at that. So this is the street we're about to climb up. So look at this amazing beauty. This street we're climbing right now together is simply the oldest street of Montmartre. It, was, it, it remained exactly the same for almost 100 years. So uh, what you're seeing right now is quite loyal to what Montmartre was at a small tiny village a century ago. It's called La Rue de l'Abreuvoir. So Abreuvoir means the fountain, like basically the water fountain, but designed for the animals, designed for the horses or designed for the donkeys. Because indeed, Montmartre being a very poor place, that would be the place where most of the people driving horse carriages, so it was a very dangerous and underpaid job. So most of these guys used to live there. And so at the end of the day, they would bring all their horses here to drink up. So you have to imagine this street being super active with like all the horse carriages coming here and all the horses drinking in the, drinking in the fountains. So again, uh, this site, this gorgeous site is absolutely exceptional. Usually, even if it's never totally crowded because most of the tourists are only stacking up next to the church, missing all the points of wandering in the small streets of Montmartre, yet, yet, seeing Montmartre so calm and so peaceful is an absolutely exceptional sight. This enormous house on our left, right here, the one like with the old bricks is the oldest house of Montmartre. On the Parisian scale it's not that old because it was built in the second half of the 1800s. However, on the Montmartre scale this is the oldest one. So you see, as I told you, built not with limestones but with those millstones. And here another very very famous famous restaurants. So it's called the Pink House. Um, has a restaurant. I don't know if I would advise you to go there. It's pretty touristy and that might be not the best value for money you can find. But the story of the restaurant is pretty funny. Again, it was a very famous restaurant that where most of the uh, artists we mentioned, Van Gogh, Monet, people like this used to go. But what's funny is the origin of the name. Indeed, La Maison Rose means the pink house. The reason it's called this way is because it was painted and painted and repainted, take, uh, taken as a model by, the, by another very famous painter called Utrillo. 
And Utrio, this painter, has one particularity. He's the only artist that was born and raised and died on Montmartre. The thing is, he had a very serious psychiatric disease. This is the reason why he could not go very away from his home. So he always only painted Montmartre and again and again and again and again. And what's funny is that he painted the house in pink and yet the house was not pink, it was white. The reason why it's pink today is because it was painted in pink, it was covered up in pink uh, in remembrance of, Utri of Utrio and its uh, beautiful paintings. Okay? So Utrio, same thing, you're gonna find all these paintings if you go to the gorgeous or same museum. It has a style of painting, we call that naive or naive impressionism. So this is a late uh, stage of impressionism. So just for your orientation, you can see a pretty impressive sight. This is the north of Paris. Basically, if I walk 10 minutes all straight this direction, I'll be outside Paris. If uh, Paris was a clock, you're looking at midnight, strictly. But this is not the most interesting. The most interesting is, of course, this. The last and oldest vineyards of Paris. So, I don't know if you're a wine expert, but you sh normally, if you know a little bit about, about wine, you should be able to tell me why, just in one site, you can be a hundred percent sure that the wine coming from this vineyards is absolutely disgusting. Yes, yes, it is exactly what I said. The wine coming from this vineyards is absolutely disgusting, and there is one simple reason for that. Well, the reason is easy, easy to find. Remember, I told you, I told you that this was the north. So that means then that the vineyards right here is facing north. The thing is, if you make a vineyard facing north, it will never get enough sun. So you might, you might ask, why then did they build a vineyard facing north? The thing is, Montmartre used to be covered up with vineyards before. It was like a very wine region, the north of Paris. But if you remember well, I told you that all the vineyards were destroyed and disappeared with this terrible plague that killed all the grapes. This one was only originally rebuilt in the 1910s, 1920s in order to be beautiful. But then the people here, the snobby people, started to produce wine again. But originally it was built facing north because it was built by the Romans. And the Romans, they don't really care about the quality of the wine because they can always mix it with water and spice and never drink the wine pure. So the fact that this uh, vineyards is facing uh, the north is uh, a proof kind of that this was built a very, very, very long time ago. I told you the wine it was very, very not good, but it doesn't mean that it's not expensive. On the contrary, the vineyards is so small that the price of a bottle can sometimes reach 75 euros. If you come in Paris, a very, very good time to come is, as you can see on this enormous white poster over there, it, this is October, okay? This is during what we call the vineyards the vineyards feast. It's called Fête de Vendange. Vendange is the moment when you gather all the grapes. If you come here, if you come in Paris and in Montmartre on that night, Montmartre is going to be absolutely full of people drinking wine and just enjoying, enjoying wine on the, on the Montmartre street. Okay, look at that. This as well is an absolute concentrate of history. This is the oldest cabaret of Paris. It's way, way older than the Moulin Rouge. This one was probably already active in the late 1600s. Uh, it's called Le Lapin Agile, so basically the Swift Rabbit. This was the place where all the people like Picasso and all the writers of the beginning of the 1900s used to gather. For example, this is here, and a bunch of artists, very famous artists, just to make fun of this abstract art that was arising at the beginning of the 1900s, decided to take the owner's donkey, dip his tail into a pot of paint and make the donkey wave his tail on a canva and then presented this um, canva made by a donkey bot, as I told you, presented it in a very famous uh, art fair pretending it was some super nice cubist artist that did it. And then they had a lot, lot of fun of all those so-called experts that were like, wow, this painting is so cool, I'm so fascinated. If you want to know more about this painting, it's called 
sunset on the Adriatic Sea. No, I'm not joking. They, they just choose this super funny name in order to make fun of the so-called artists. You see, this story that happened in around 1911, it's quite typical of this artistic atmosphere of the end of the Montmartre age. Indeed, all those artists that did this joke, you see, they all have something in common. After a few years after this funny history, they all ended up in a trench, in the trenches, with a rifle in their hands, and most of them died. Indeed, World War I is mostly considered as the end of the Montmartre history. Uh, what I mean is, like, if you were an artist that would come between World War I and World War II, for example, some, some, some people like Hemingway, or some people like Picasso after he got famous, then you would rather go in the Latin Quarter, in the center of Paris, or Saint-Germain, or around the Montparnasse Tower. Montmartre was still a very nice place to be. However, uh, the golden age of Montmartre with uh, Picasso uh, when he was young, with Van Gogh, with Monet, with Renoir, with all those guys. So the golden age of Montmartre, this is basically the end of the 1800s until World War I. All right, guys, so now we're going to have another small break because we're going to have our amazing conclusion. I'm going to climb up Montmartre to show you the amazing view up there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sacré Coeur. We are almost at the very top of the hill, but we are at the back of the Sacré Coeur Church. I brought you here, which is not the most famous site and yet the most beautiful, because this is the most perfect angle to truly appreciate the beauty and the quality of this incredible church. So we're going to go, let's go inside this park where most of the Montmartre, the Parisians living in Montmartre, have their little habits, sport habits. Okay, so as I told you, and this is very important for me to mention that, today, the day I'm filming this video, we're on a very, very, very particular day because we're celebrating the 150th birthday of the last day of the Commune de Paris, this very important revolution. Look at that, you can, you can even see right there that some people wrote about the Commune. Ha, oh, look at that. Isn't that incredible? So, La Commune de Paris is a very important and dark moment of Paris. Indeed, uh, at, during the Franco-Prussian War, that means during the war between the Prussians and the French, Paris went through a very, very hard siege. The Parisians are to arm themselves and to defend themselves from the Prussians. But when the war was over, when France was defeated, the Parisians refused to give back their weapons to the Prussians, mostly because they considered that they did not deserve to get defeated. They wanted to keep fighting. So the government that did not like the Parisians because they used to consider them as, um, I'd say, red, communist and socialist, decided to take back the weapons by force. Most of those weapons were right here, where I'm standing. It was like a bunch of cannons that the Parisians took and wanted to keep in order to defend themselves. On the 18th of March, 1871, the government tried to take those, we to take those weapons by force, but it didn't work out. Uh, the, uh, the army shot in the crowd and killed one guy, and that triggered La Commune de Paris on the 18th of March. And during two months, Paris became totally independent from the rest of France. You have to imagine that Paris was, during this short time, kind of a socialist, uh, independent republic. But after two months of siege by the French government itself that wanted to take back Paris, finally the army attacked Paris. The French army attacked Paris. This, they, began, they started the attack on the 21st of May and they ended up on the 28th. The Parisians fought street after street, meter after meter. It is called in French la semaine sanglante, the bloody week, because within almost only seven days, this is between 15 to 20 thousand Parisians that got slaughtered by the army. Okay, so this is the reason why today I really want to mention this uh, very particular day, simply because the Sacré Coeur, this enormous church you see built here, well, it was built right after La Commune de Paris. And it was built where it all started. So basically where the first guy of La Commune got killed on the 18th of March, 1871. 
However, it was not built in remembrance of the dead Parisians, not at all. It was built by the very conservative and right-wing government that took over after the revolution. This church was not in remembrance of the Parisians' death. It was in remembrance of the Parisian crimes against the Parisians. So it might sound surprising now because today this is one of the most popular churches of Paris, very touristic, people love it. And yet, and yet, back when it was built, so the very end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s, this church was hated by the Parisians. It was considered as an insult, like the government built a church exactly where they fought, they fight started, their revolution started, a revolution that was against the church, that was against religion, okay? Just to give you a simple example, even Victor Hugo himself did not like the church, okay? He considered this church as a uh, a building as a crime, as a crime building, okay? However, let's mention a little bit the architecture and how it was built and then we're going to go on the other side for we can have our conclusion facing the amazing view. So you can see that currently the church is very, very white. This is because on the contrary of the other buildings of Paris, it was not built with limestone. I mean, it was built with a special limestone that has this ability of cleaning itself with the rain. This is the reason why on the contrary of the other buildings of Paris, most of the black stains you see are where the rain cannot reach. As well, you might be surprised by those very curvy shapes, curvy um, round domes. It looks like almost like there would be an orthodox church, you see, like a Russian or Serbian church. Well, it's not, but it's simply because this is what we call the Byzantine style, a very popular style at the very, big, at the very end of the 1800s. So it was built this way because it's like, a, it's like copying. Um, imitating the style of the Byzantines, you know, uh, the late Roman Empire in Constantinople. Last but not least, uh, there is always someone praying 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week in this church. This is one of the particularity of the order of the Sacré Coeur, the name of the order that takes, um, that takes uh, care of this place. As well, you have to know that possibly if you book very early, you can sleep for free. You can just stay for free in the church. The only condition, and this is a hard one, is that you have to wake up every hour to pray. Okay. So guys, we're going to have a small break just to give me the time uh, for me to uh, get around the church. And then we're going to have our conclusion. See you in a minute. Okay. So you see, the, the hill is amazingly calm. I was just in the park right there and I'm now turning around the enormous church. Um, there is one thing I'd like to show you before we reach the landscape is this little church here. So if you come in Paris, do not make uh, the mistake, I'd say, to miss this church for the simple reason that this is extremely old, way, way older than the Sacré-Cœur. Uh, it's more, almost as old as Notre Dame. It was built on the 12th century. The thing is, this church was originally part of an enormous abbey, very famous abbey, a, a, a monastery for nuns, for women, that used to stand on Montmartre, sadly, and has most of the religious buildings during the French Revolution, in 1789 until 1799, the abbey was destroyed, and the only thing left is this church. So please do not forget it and visit it. It's an absolute jewel of Gothic style, super humble and modest, just cute. And every time, even if the, crowd, uh, the, the crowdiest and even during the busiest day of touristic season, it's always empty. So that would be really a shame to miss it. Okay, <laughs> bad timing. We arrive exactly when the guy is like moaning the lawn. But you don't need any comments anyway. Because look at what we're reaching now. You are facing the most beautiful sight of Paris. I'm just gonna get a little bit away from the machine. So here we are guys, facing the most amazing view of Paris. So you see, 
all the main buildings of Paris are just in front of your eyes. The Louvre, the Notre Dame, the Pantheon, Saint Eustache, Saint Severin, everything. The Eiffel Tower would rather be behind those trees here, so it's a bit more complicated to get the view. But basically, all Paris is in front of your eyes. And behind me, of course, the entrance of the Sacré-Cœur. So, if you come in Paris, you're going to see that having such a site, which means like having this place being totally empty in the middle of the sun, is really, really rare and exceptional. Usually this place, mostly on the evening, is covered up with people. They just come to chill and stand on those steps and drink a few beers, watching at the view or kissing each other when they are lovers. This is here, guys. This is here that we're going to conclude this little tour, this little introduction to the Montmartre history. Of course, if, we come, if you come to see our tours, or if you take some of our tours, we're going to stay way longer in Montmartre. Montmartre is a universe. It's a world itself. We could spend hours in those very little narrow streets, winding streets, to talk about all the artists, the impressionists, the post-impressionists, the realism, the cubism, talk, I mean, talking about revolution, feminism. Montmartre simply never ends, okay? So guys, I really hope you enjoyed that tour. Do not hesitate to uh, get more of our tours, to get our contact details. Do not hesitate neither to let us know uh, if you liked the tour, to let us know if you enjoyed it. Leave some comments, leave some uh, like buttons. I wish you an excellent day and I really hope we're going to see you in Paris very soon. I kiss you. Bye bye. bye.